Hey, it's Mark here, and we're continuing in our series on um, renewing your mind, um, biblical systematic theology. And I know that a lot of people in the Christian community have this idea of, you know, uh, theology being dry as dust and irrelevant, impractical, that sort of thing. But the study of theology is for, for every Christian because every Christian is a theologian. Um, not in the technical sense, but we're all theologians in the, our study of God. We're either good theologians or bad theologians, um, depending upon the situation God has put us in and the effort that we have put into understanding Him rightly. And I just wanted to uh, emphasize again that, um, you know, folks talk about how Christianity is a personal relationship with Christ, and it is. However, even in a human personal relationship, um, the more we know about a person, the more we love them. And that's what theology is all about, is seeing the connection between knowledge of God and our love of Him, and bringing those two together. So, uh, tonight we're continuing our series on the, the Word of God. And just as there are attributes of, um, of God, there are attributes of God's Word. And tonight we're looking at the clarity of God's Word. Historically, it has been referred to as a perspicuity of God's Word, which is kind of ironic because you got a word like perspicuity, which nobody knows what the heck that means. It's unclear, as opposed to refer to the clarity of scripture. Anyway, it's just a big $10 word for the perspicuity uh, for the clarity of scripture. And certainly it's one of the most important practical um, doctrines um, and elements, characteristics of the word of God is its clarity. Uh, so let's jump right in. And um, I trust that, you know, that will be teachable. I mentioned from the outset that, that I'm going to be teaching things that, uh, some things that maybe you haven't heard before, um, some things that you may not even like. But you know, my desire is to teach the whole counsel of God. And if you do hit a snag, uh, a portion of scripture that, that you don't like or is hard, um, See that as a, a, a um, well, be a good brand and search the scriptures, and um, that might be a possibility for accelerated growth. Has been for me. So, in uh, this discussion of the clarity of scripture, I'm going to start by reading from not just my denomination's um, catechism, but it's, it's um, it was written in the 1600s, the Westminster Confession of Faith, and there's a whole bunch of Presbyterian and Reformed um, uh, denominations that stand on this as a subordinate um, foundation, subordinate to Scripture. Anyway, with reference to the clarity of Scripture, it says this, because I like, I like what it says. It summarizes it pretty clearly. Because remember what systematic theology is, it asks the question, what does the whole of Scripture say about um, a certain doctrine? And in this case, it's the clarity of Scripture. And this is a statement about that. So, quote, All things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor are alike clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of scripture or other that not only the learned but the unlearned in a due use of the ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. End quote. This is a carefully nuanced statement with important qualifications. It's directed against the 
attempts in the Roman Catholic Church at the time to keep the laity from studying the scripture on their own. The Roman Church feared that if laymen were to interpret scripture for themselves, they would come up with unorthodox, even bizarre interpretations of it. And that fear, as we now observe, was not totally groundless. Um, if you look on Facebook, I hope this doesn't sound harsh, but there are hundreds and hundreds of group, Christian groups that discuss this, that, and the other. And oftentimes it spins off into basically let's share our ignorance type um, situation because it's just, just going in without any guidance. Um, anyway, but scripture itself, as in Deuteronomy 8 3, Psalm 19 7, the whole of Psalm 119, and Matthew 4 4 says that God's written word is for everybody. We live by it. The confession, of course, agrees, but the confession statement does not encourage autonomous or lawless Bible study. It does not make every layman an expert in Scripture. It recognizes that not every part of Scripture is equally clear to everybody. Laymen, indeed all Christians, need to watch their steps in studying the Bible. There are mysteries in Scripture beyond anyone's understanding, and there's many things in Scripture that we can't understand without more knowledge of the languages of Scripture and its cultural background. So the Confession also says that those who would study Scripture should be humble enough to seek help. The kind of Bible study it recommends is not individualistic, one should use, make use of the due use of ordinary means. And that would include things like your pastor's preaching and uh, the teaching of the elders and, and so on, as well as um, uh, the ministry illumination of the Holy Spirit and of prayer. So, um, and moving on, uh, I have a bunch of points I want to make in reference to the clarity of Scripture. The first one is that when it comes to what's required to know for salvation, the Bible is utterly clear. Um, pers perspicuous. <laughs> it's utterly clear. Uh, yes, people have misunderstood the Roman Catholic Church. Um, that's due to sin. But if you look at Romans 3 and 4 and Galatians, uh, the doctrine of salvation is, is, is so clear how we are saved. Um, it's as clear as the, uh, the blue sky um, on a uh, cloudless day. It does, even um, Peter admits in 2 Peter 3.15 that some of Paul's writings are difficult. But again, when it comes to the essentials of salvation, Scripture is clear. Point number two, the covenant Lord communicates successfully. And in order to do that, he has to speak clearly. That's the whole, um, for, that's the whole notion behind successful communication is that it has to be clear. Or to state it negatively, Unclarity leads to unsuccessful communication. So uh, the point being is that the covenant Lord has successfully communicated to us. And so that implies the clarity of scripture. And, you know, we're told in, in the New Testament that as opposed to the occult, which uh, there are hidden mysteries which have to be um, uncovered, the Bible uh, in the New Testament the Mysterions or mysteries are revealed to us, to, to all believers, clearly. Now, thirdly, we need to recognize that sometimes God does not intend in his sovereignty, he does not intend for some people to understand the Bible. We see this in Isaiah chapter 6 as an act of judgment, whether it be then or now. 
And we know that according to Romans 1.18, God's wrath is being poured out present tense. And one way that, that can manifest itself is if in certain situations, God will make it um, the under, understanding of Scripture not clear. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but that's because that has to do with an act of God's judgment. And we're dealing more with the, the general understanding of God's word. Point number four. Because scripture is clear, it creates obligation. In John 5, 39 through 40, Jesus alludes to this. And which means that the clarity of scripture is an ethical doctrine. Because scripture is clear, that means that our obedience is required. You know, it's not something that is so difficult that, uh, you know, we have to struggle to understand. But because it's clear, it, it creates an absolute obligation on our part to embrace uh, what it asks us to embrace or to believe what uh, scripture says to believe and so forth. Point number five, uh, when it, regarding any age of a person, Scripture always is clear enough for us to carry out our present responsibilities before God. Let me say that again. Regarding any age, Scripture is always clear enough for us to carry out our present responsibilities before God. You know, a one-year-old has very limited understanding of what the Bible says, but when they get to be two years old, a child um, has more conceptual abilities. So a six-year-old, a 26-year-old, a 66-year-old, point being, again, is that Scripture always is clear enough for us to carry out our present responsibilities before God, whatever our emotional and psychological development, developmental stage is. Because God, you know, recognizes that and has ordained it and has made us you know, to be, um, to develop in a certain manner. Point number six is that we see the clarity of Scripture in that in uh, Psalm 19.7, the whole of Psalm 119, uh, where, where scripture makes wise the simple and is a light unto our path. And that's, that's a clear uh, reference to the clarity of scripture. Number seven, we see the clarity of Scripture in Jesus' repeated phrase in the Gospels where he says, Have you not read? Have you not read that from the beginning God made them male and female? Implying that uh, the folks that he was having a controversy with should have understood what was being said. In this case, in Genesis chapter 2. So, point number eight, why do people misunderstand? Why are there misunderstandings then between people? Well, there's several reasons for misunderstandings. There's sin. Uh, there can be pridefulness. There can be uh, unteachableness. Um, people clinging to notions that they're unwilling to be a good Berean and think about, uh, you know, whether or not what they're, they believe is, is uh, truly scriptural. Uh, another reason why there's misunderstanding is due to ignorance of the relevant data, uh, whether it's cultural, background data of the Bible, um, and so forth. Another reason uh, would be due to faulty assumptions on one or both person's parts. Or it could be due to um, someone assuming that the Bible is clear on a subject when in fact it's not. 
You know, the Bible is not clear on everything. There are mysteries in Scripture. And to that end, I wanted to read uh, the classic text from Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. It's a lovely text. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. Okay, there's, there's some things that, um, that are mysteries that are incomprehensible to us. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the works of this law. Okay, so that definitely implies the clarity of Scripture. You can't do something you don't understand. So you have the, um, the distinction there um, in uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29. And point number nine, the Reformers had a uh, profound reawakening to the priesthood of all believers. And... Luther, as you may know, translated the Bible into German to put it into the lay people's hands. Um, but getting back to the notion of the priesthood of all believers is that we don't need to go through an intermediary. intermediary. Uh, it is the uh, individual Christian who is themselves a priest. Um, as the New Testament clearly uh, teaches us. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't need teachers um, and elders and so forth, as we're told in the um, uh, pastoral epistles. But generally speaking, and again, it's, they, they recaptured the beautiful biblical teaching on the priesthood of all believers. Um, now, an implication moving from the truth of this doctrine to some of the implications, and I have two that I want to talk about, is that because Scripture is clear, the perspicuity of it, we can be certain and humble at the same time. And in this day and age, that is... Um, just seems to be an impossibility because in our culture in which truth is assumed to be subjective and relativistic that um, is flip-flopped and it makes me want to weep and that is that it's more the idea that Uncertainty equals to humility. Now, of course, there's a time to be uncertain, but when Scripture is clear, then we need to be certain. And there's, there is, um, it's not. If God is clear on a certain topic, it's not an act of humility to preface your words. Well, in my opinion, or this is my truth. No, if God is clear, then it's possible and necessary for us to speak with clarity. And my point again being that it's um, in light of the clarity of God's word, we can th be um, we can be certain and we can be humble at the same time. In fact, they should lead to each other. The certainty should lead to humility. And humility should lead to certainty. Uh, there's a symbiotic relationship there. It reminds me of a situation with Martin Luther. He was having a debate with um, Erasmus. And Erasmus was chiding, chiding Luther because Luther had a, ten, had a tendency to get um, riled up and uh, just the way he, dis he the way he was dis discussing the importance of justification by faith alone, and Erasmus was saying, "Calm, calm down, Martin. You're getting um, you, you know, all bent out of shape. Just calm down, you know." And Luther, um, in his um, 
And, and the only way that Luther could, could say it is, uh, he said, God damn. He said, uh, the Holy Spirit is no skeptic. Um, the skeptics at this, that time and before were like Jans and Jambres and, um, as we're told in scripture, is always learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. And, um, but that when the Holy Spirit talks, he doesn't talk out of both sides of his mouth. It's the Holy Spirit of truth. And when he speaks, he speaks with utter certitude and truth, certainty. And so the point that Luther was making and that we need to stand on is that, um, again, the Holy Spirit is no skeptic. And when the Bible is clear on a topic, then we can, with humility, speak with boldness and clarity. Certainly, the gospel, we can speak with clarity. You know, Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God, salvation. And we need to reclaim that. I can't tell you how many times the last 10 years, um, people looked at me, it seemed, like I had two heads just simply because I was affirm with boldness and certainty that I knew with certainty what happened when people died. Why? Because scripture is clear about what happens when people die. That's why I knew why there was no such thing as earthbound spirits, along with other things like the atonement and the doctrine of God and so forth. But um, and the scripture is really clear, uh, Hebrews 9, 27, and so forth, that you know, when we die, we stand before God, and we are sentenced to heaven or hell. And uh, it's something in our age, we need to recapture more than ever um, solid biblical doctrine, which doesn't and is not apologetic um, as far as, I'm not talking about apologetics as far as defense of the faith, but as far as being um, not apologizing for, for being certain and um, speaking the truth with boldness. Our people need for us to be bold. Now, this last application of the clarity of Scripture, I do so with fear and with trembling. Um, some of the people I know, respect, and love the most um, have this, this Bible. And so I say with all the love and all the gentleness in my heart, um, I wouldn't even be bringing this up if I didn't think it was significant enough. But my prefatory comment is this. With reference to the King James Version of the Bible, is it a marvelous, beautiful translation? But it's time to move on. Please. Please listen to my humble plea for, for why. Mark Ward Dr. Mark Ward was raised on the King James Bible and has a profound respect for it. And like I said, some of my closest friends whom I love and respect are King James folks. And uh, Ward was raised on, he just wrote a book entitled Authorized the Use of misuse of the King James Bible. I'll say it again. The, uh, the author is Mark Ward, W-A-R-D. Name of the book is Authorized, the Use, Misuse, King James Version of the Bible. And he likens to the situation to like a rubber band. And then from 1611 to uh, 2018, it's like the King James Version is like a rubber band. It is stretched and stretched and stretched, and it's about to snap. 
um, I'm using his, some of his arguments and some of my own. And again, I say this tenderly and gently, because um, at least 55% of Bible-believing, Lord-loving Christians are, are buying, currently buying still, the old King James uh, version of the Bible. So there's a great affection for it. Um, Ward states that, you know, obviously it's been 400 years since that uh, version was written. And he states that um, numerous words in that version are now dead. They're not even used at all. You know, 400 years is a long, long time for the English language to evolve. <clears throat> so you not only have words that are dead that folks no longer even use, they don't even know what they, that, that they mean, but on a much larger scale in this evolution, many, many of the words are archaic and have changed their meanings. You know, we saw the, the change of the word gay and um, just my parents' generation, they lamented the fact that when they were kids or teenagers, uh, gay meant, you know, being happy. But, you know, it changed in the course of one generation. Well, in 400 years, we need to realize that the and now and that sort of thing is, is not holy. It's not, there's no such thing as a holy language as far as um, God spoke to us in, in ordinary human language. I'll get back to that in a minute. But it's an archaic language that is setting up a, a, a barrier. Um, he also makes the point that the translators, the original translator for the King James Version in the preface state explicitly that their design was to make a translation that was for the quote vulgar, uh, that is for the vernacular, put it in the vernacular of the people. And this is a quote by the uh, original translators. Um, so that Christ is speaking to them in their mother tongue. That was their desire. And uh, Ward states, and I agree with him, I, I really believe that the original translation committee for the King James Version would be um, aghast that their translation was still being used because they, they recognized the whole reason why they translated it because they knew that a, a, a new translation, a readable one, in the um, vernacular of the people um, was needed. So I really believe they'd be the first ones to say that, what are you guys doing? You, we, we do need to update it, at least the New King James Version. Um, he also mentions 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14, which is interesting because that is the closest thing that we have in Scripture of kind of a a window into a um, worship service, what it looked like in New Testament times. And it, uh, Ward mentions that at least seven times in 1 Corinthians 14, there is an appeal by, by Paul to the intelligibility or clarity of, of communication the importance of intelligibility or clarity of communication within uh, the context of uh, Christian fellowship and of teaching. And obviously, to me, you, you know, if you have, have words that are archaic, that is a barrier to clarity. Uh, This is one that comes from my own. Uh, think about how far God has has gone to, to communicate clearly with us. You know, talk, Paul talked about how he went to heaven and the, um, and, and uh, Saint Corinthians 
and how he could not he could not lawfully speak about some of the things that he saw and heard. And I, it's my own personal uh, belief that he, he may have heard the Trinity, Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, speaking to each other in their in their mother tongue, in their language. I don't know that. I'm just speculating. Um, but there's, to me, there's no question that there, the Trinity has their own tongue, their own language with which they communicate with each other. And it... Um, so when they, when the, the, the Spirit, excuse me, when the Trinity communicated with us through His Word, um, the, the image that Calvin uses, it's like a mother with a two-year-old. Um, think about the getting down, kneeling down, and, and, and the kind of language that a mom would use with a two-year-old to communicate um, truth to this child, but in a mommy-type way to her little boy, her little girl. She's speaking truly, she's speaking the truth, but it's in language that a two-year-old could understand. And that's a picture, obviously, of our Heavenly Father, who's infinite, has his own language, but he chose in the Old Testament to use ordinary um, Hebrew to communicate to the Old Testament community, and then he used um, the ordinary Koine Greek to communicate to the New Covenant community, in fact, the very words of Jesus, um, most scholars think that Jesus um, spoke the Aramaic and that his own words were um, the original translation um, in, in the Greek New Testament, you know, translates Jesus. That's the first translation is of Jesus' own words from Aramaic to, 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 to Greek. But it is in the Koine Greek, which is in the ordinary. It's not classical, high, uh, brow type Greek language. And it was the language of the people of that day. Not archaic, but the people of that day. And so you see how far the Lord went to communicate successfully and clearly to us in ordinary human language. So why should we add an unnecessary impediment to successful communication with people today because of using English language that's 400 years old, that has many words that folks trip over, don't understand, um, may not even like to hear the words because of how archaic they are. Um, I wasn't raised in, so I, you know, in, in circles with the King James. So it, when I hear it, it, it doesn't have the same emotional effect on me as it does some of you. Honestly, when I hear the King James Version, I want to shut off. I, I, can't, I don't. It doesn't communicate to me. It just doesn't. And I'd, I'd like for you to try to put yourself in the shoes of a person who wasn't brought up on it and who you're trying to teach about the new age to or whatever. Um, my point being is if God has gone so far to communicate in ordinary human language, again, you, again using the analogy of a, a little uh, a mom with a little child, then, you know, we need, we need to get rid of this impediment uh, to the clarity of Scripture. That's what we're talking about, is the clarity of God's communication with us. So why do we have a version of the Bible that has a built-in impediment of clarity to it.
I mean, is on every page there are many archaic words that folks would stumble over, and it uh, the whole idea of, of communication is is for it to be successful through clarity, and so uh, hopefully I'm saying that gently enough because I truly love folks that I know that that use it. Uh, one argument that I've, I've heard, and honestly, some the arguments I've heard to defend the King James have been embarrassing. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's just really, a, it's just not good, um, it's just not good scholarship. Um, a, a lot of people talk about the number of people who are on the translation committee and how much knowledge they had of the Bible and of culture back then uh, that that were on the translation committee for the King James and yeah they were they were quite a an astute group of people but if you if you read the preface to the e ESV which is my preference you have more people and people who have more knowledge than these guys did um, because they have 400 years on them to, to learn more truths about Bible trends and Bible tools and, and so forth. And if you're, um, you know, about the Textus Receptus and that sort of thing, you know, you can, you can deal with that. Um, I would just say that I'll just put that on the shelf for right now. Um, but I think the unspoken assumption that some folks have is that there's some sense in which the um, King James Version is almost inspired in a special way. Um, of course, you can't find a biblical text for that. This is we're talking about six, 1,600 years after the close of, of the New Testament. Um, but the way some folks speak, you would think that the King James was the you know if it was good enough for the Apostle Paul type type thing. Well, there were there were popular versions of the Bible. I don't know if you knew this or not, but the Geneva Bible came over with the the Puritans and the and the uh, Pilgrims. And maybe one of the reasons why it didn't get elevated as high as the King James Version was simply because it didn't support the notion of the divine right of kings. I mean, it was written a little bit before uh, the King, uh, J King James Version. Um, so, and I would just also reiterate the fact that the these and the thous um, and so forth. That that's not holy language. We we I think we emotionally get attached to that, and that's fine if if we want to do that in our own Bible study. Um, what I'm pleading with you, as far as communication with other people, is to at least consider um, using another modern translation like the ESV because it does focus on literal translation of scripture much more so than many of the other ones. I know the problems with the NIV and the ESV to me is um, a very good, in my opinion, the best. But I know this is an emotional issue, but I think for a lot of folks it's become Protestant version of tradition for them and I really don't know of any good solid theological reasons I've seen a lot of pastors get um, who usually don't talk about doctrine very much get real real exercised about uh, and upset about this this uh, King James version um, debate but Again, uh, the balance of the arguments is, is just simply that um, those these and thous are not holy language. And my advice would be to purchase a, um, 
to, to use depending upon whatever your purpose is, is to, to get uh, several Bibles. And um, if you want to continue using the King James in your own personal Bible study, that's, that's beautiful. But just when it comes to public communication, I would, I would uh, ask that you would consider um, switching based on the topic we're discussing tonight, and that's the clarity of God's word for successful communication. Amen. Thank you.